Welcome back to Switzer. Is the dividend stock play and should we be chasing more at risk equities? Is, there, is, it, is this dividend play over and done and dusted? Joining us to debate this timely investment issue is George Baburis, the Interim Chief Investment Officer at Equity Trustees in Melbourne, and Paul Rickard from the Switzer Super Report. There, he's in the studio with me. How are you guys? Hello. Okay. I'm great, thanks, Peter. Fantastic. I didn't know how to do that one. All right, so start with you, George. Give Melbourne its, uh, its due respect. Is this bull market, um, how long have we got in this bull market we're in now? Uh, probably another three years. Why? Economic growth globally and domestically looks set to, to progress in the right direction. Uh, GDP trend to above trend growth, which means earnings in the future will be expanding. As long as it's not too much of a boom, therefore you won't get too much of a bust. So we passed those macro shocks of the past four years and five years, uh, and Europe and those issues are behind us from the structural. So going forward, you get a three-year continuation of the bull market on the basis of constructive, slightly above trend GDP, therefore earnings expansion in the years ahead. Okay. So that. Okay, Paul, what's your view? Look, I'm about the same page as George. I'd probably say we've got about two years left. I think we're already... Sort of Always the cautious ex-banker, aren't you? <laughs> I, thought, I think we're actually already about 18 months into it. Yeah. Um, look, typically, a uh, bull market will take our previous highs. So our previous high is about 6,800. Yeah. There's some argument because of all the capital raising that occurred after the GFC that realistically the highs is more like about 6,200. Huh. But, uh, so, you know, we've got some way to go. Our accumulation index, which includes dividends, is at an all-time high. So, uh, but I still think there's upside, and I think we're 18 months to two years um, if this cycle is still to go. Yep. So I look for sort of 2015 would be the end of the end When you start getting a little bit towy. Yeah. All right. So, George, what's, what's your view? I've heard the capital raising argument before. What's your view on that? Yeah, the capital raising to me, so 68, uh, 28 was the high in November 2007. And I calculate 6150 is the equivalent to get there because of the dilution of that massive capital raising that happened in Australia. So 6150 is your 6828 sort of high. Yeah. And that's going to happen at the end of 2014 or the first quarter of 2015. Okay, all right, good. So just while well, I've got you there, George, how's my 5,500 by the end of this year looking? It's been a big call. I stuck my neck out there. Is it a chance? Yeah, it's, it's well on. I haven't changed from 54.50, and that's been there since November last year. I think we're well placed for that. Remember, markets don't always go up in one way, mm. uh, but, but we're not looking for a 20% sort of uh, retraction here. We're looking at markets being just normal volatility, normal events. 54.50, I believe. You're 55.50. Yeah. You're on the money, Pete. Right, Paul, you very still disagree with me. Not. <laughs> not <laughs> <yet>. <laughs> 5,500, what do you reckon? Uh, uh, we've been saying that, Peter. I hate to agree with you on this occasion, <laughs> but I do. Okay, good. Uh, we're seeing the retest of 5200. Look, it may not get there straight away. I thought today's market performance was pretty good. It opened down, yeah. uh, it came back up. You yeah. know, I've been surprised by just some of the, um, you know, the, the anecdote stories. You meet someone for a coffee who's been in cash for the last five years yeah, and now yeah. talking about bank shares. So, mm. look, I think retail investors are taking this market higher. Yeah. And uh, there's still a lot of money sitting in cash that is yet to move. Yeah, and I look, I, I, I've got to say, the story I wrote in the Switzer Super Report yesterday, I looked at Westpac, and it's still yielding about 5.3% or mm -hmm. something like that. So if I'm a retiree and a self-managed super fund, that grows is up close to 7%, doesn't it? So even if it goes from 32 bucks to 35 over the next year, that's a 10% gain. People could be making 12, 13% no problems well, in, in good quality yeah, look, companies. It's still pretty attractive, and I think the dividend play, there's something there. Yeah. I mean, I, I think as the market goes high, I think you're going to see other parts of the market lead it. Yeah. So I'm not in the camp that the banks are necessarily the best value, but yeah. for a, you know, a person uh, either managing their uh, own self managed superannuation fund mm -hmm. or other retiree with some, with some uh, who wants the, the, the stability of a regular income and not too much capital risk, it's still hard the bank stocks to look reasonable value. Yeah, what well, about you, George? Do you think uh, dividend plays in banks are, are done and dusted or still got a bit more uh, room to move? Uh, still a bit more room. Remember, a bit of growth, a bit of income. You've got to have a diversified portfolio. For most people out there in their self-managed super fund, your core Aussie equity weighting has got a bit of both. You need a bit of income and a bit of growth expectations. Remember, you're buying future earnings and receiving a dividend along the way is very important. And you're right about the big four banks. Fully grossed up, you're averaging around about 7%. And, uh, and you know, as I always say, Peter, when I get a chance, why buy a T1 listed hybrid? 
uh, that limits the upside and you share the downside, simply, uh, and they rank pretty much as, as pure equity anyway, just buy the underlying uh, perpetual bank shares. And uh, remember, if you're 55 years of age, go to pension phase, you're living for another 40 years. Uh, it's a long time, you need to fund it, and you do need income along the way. <laughs> Don't you love statistics? You can use them in any way you like, live in the 90. Now listen, um, let's, let's, uh, Paul's got a chart here, let's put the chart up and we'll, and we'll see what it says. Yeah, so this is a chart, Peter, of just tells you how badly what we call the small caps have done in the market over the last five years. Yeah. Now, okay. we've got, we've it's got, on screen now, yeah, mate. We've got, we've got three ASX indices. You've got the top 20, yep. which have led the market on any one year, three year, and five year total returns. Yeah, terrific so part, If you just it? had the top 20 stocks, you're yeah. laughing. Now, yeah. a lot of self managed superannuation funds and others, you know, mm. particularly retail investors, are very heavily concentrated in the four banks mm. and you know, the Woolworths and the West Farmers, yeah. and maybe have a bit of BHP and Rio in there. But, mm. you know, they're very much in the top 20 stocks, so they've, yep. done, they've done pretty well. Yeah. If you've been in the 200, which is really the market, you yeah. can see the return there, 25% over one year, and uh, not so good, you know, the yeah. per annum rate. But the 200 are driven by the big ones at the top yeah. anyway, aren't yep. they? Yeah. But what's more interesting is what we call the small ordinary. So these yeah. are stocks number 100 to 300. Yeah. And this is not the micro caps, there's another 1800 stocks below, below that. Below right? that, okay, right. But these are stocks number 100 to 300. Yeah, which aren't bad companies. Which aren't bad companies. Well, some well known and names. And their return in it. over five years is still negative. Yeah. It's so, been a shocker. Okay, so looking at Paul, do you say these guys are like a, a wound up spring, they're going to come good over the next couple of years? Well, I think there's a number of things going for it to suggest that at some stage, and I think it's already started to happen you're going to see much higher growth in the smaller companies, in the, in the smaller stocks. Yep. There are a couple of reasons. First of all, the sectors they represent tend to be more of the things like consumer discretionary and industrial sectors. There may more, many mm. more companies overweight there than they are in the top 20 or the top 100. Yep. And so in a market where the economy is growing locally, you've got potentially a lower Australian dollar that's helping I think consumers are just waiting to open up the checkbook. Yeah. I really am. When they, very, feel, when they feel confident. When yeah. they feel confident. Yeah. The election's out of the way. I think that there's good reason that some of those sectors are going to do a lot better. Mm. And then thirdly is sort of the mean reversion theory, right? We know in markets mm. <laughs> nothing goes on forever. And typically your smaller companies grow at a faster rate than your larger companies. Now, mm. some might call that management. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> might mean not the charitable view, yes. but that's what's happened over time. So. Yeah. Over the last, since the GFC, the smaller companies have done really badly in aggregate. Yep. And uh, I think it's time to think about, in your portfolio, uh, looking for... More exposure companies. to More it. More exposure to them. Yep. George, what's your view? Yeah, broadly the same. Uh, look, we've just had two really bad years of uh, earnings growth in the broader Aussie equity market, which reflects the uh, white-collar recession in the eastern states. So as we're getting the stimulus coming through, but we need a few preconditions. We need lower rates, lower rates for longer. We need the Aussie dollar to be lower than where it is at the moment. And you need the turnaround in business conditions, which looks likely to happen yeah. next year on the back of the confidence. Well, if those all line up, that's very good for the small cap sector. But just beware. Don't have a large weighting to small caps. And be very cognizant that uh, while there's a small percentage become large caps, uh, there's a lot of risk embedded in there. So obviously cap how much small cap uh, you have, outsource it to a fund manager or do your homework at home. But the turnaround story is broadly supportive in 2014 and 15 for the small cap sector and please don't buy small cap gold stock. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I totally support that. But George, just if someone is listening to this and, and they are putting their own portfolio together and let's just say they have a, an appetite for risk but they are retirees, uh, what, what, what percentage of your portfolio would you dedicate to the, the, the more, you know, the core stocks, the conviction stocks that might be really good for dividends, and what percentage would you throw open to a small cap exposure? Okay, let's just assume you're 55, you exercise pension phase, you're in Nirvana, it's a, it's a unique <laughs> system in the, in the Western world. Yeah. So out of that, you need um, um, the core part, most of the Aussie equity component should be, you know, you know, 60 to 80 percent should be large cap, dividend plays, a bit of growth plays, the majors in the top 100. Yeah. Outside of that, you know, you can put 10 percent into some small cap higher risk. But remember this, if you're receiving or potentially targeting a 10 percent dividend, 
that is an unreasonable expectation. Mm. So be very cognizant that if it's saying 14 or 15 percent, most of those companies the price will adjust accordingly and there's a downside. So, so balance it. No more than 10 percent for a high risk person, 55 years of age in pension phase in that small cap space. Once you get in that small cap space, make sure you're targeting the right sort of sectors. So the turnaround should be in con consumer discretionary. So who's up and coming in there and wh what's your opportunity? Some diversified financials are in there and some basic industrial sort of sector sort of plays. That's the sort of the way to play it. But be very cognizant not to go to the edges of the risk uh, and that means avoid small cap gold stocks because you're not getting, it's an oxymoron to assume you're getting any income from that play. Okay. So 10% small cap play is what you should be targeting and that's a, that's a risky strategy. Okay Paul, what's your, your Look, view I, on how much and how do we get these small I, caps? I, I broadly agree with George. So I hate gold as you know, I'm a gold, yeah. perpetual gold bear yeah. so I never touch a gold stock yeah. and uh, so 100% agree with George there. Yeah. I think the exposure can be a little bit more, I think more like about 20 to 30 per cent, but here's a couple of ways you can do it. Uh, one, if you just want to take an index approach, there are a couple of ETFs that just look at the small ordinary. So mm -hmm. there are two in, uh, ETFs, one from iShares, one from State Street, that track what I call the, the small ordinaries index. Yep. Uh, secondly, there, is, um, uh, there are some... Uh, you know, a lot of really good fund managers in this space. So I'm, you and I, you know, we believe in very much sort of doing a lot yourself, but yeah. when it comes to small cap stocks, mm. this is where you need expertise. It's hard to kick the tires on really company. hard to kick the tires. Mm. There's no way as I as an individual can get a diversified portfolio of small cap stocks. Yeah. I'd rather leave that to one of the experts. Mm. And there are both some good listed investment companies and fund managers in this space. You have a lot in your program, people mm. like Jeff Wilson, Roger Montgomery, though he's not a small cap guy, is mm. sort of in this space. Yeah. You know, Perpetual runs an excellent small cap funds, and I'm sure some of the work that George and his team is doing mm. uh, probably have some experts in this area. So, mm. look, you can go the index approach, but uh, think also about a fund manager. And again, I'd probably look at, at taking a bit of manager insurance and finding two or three managers. Yeah, so create like a little fund of funds yeah. based around small caps. Yeah. Yeah, George, what's your view on that? Yeah, that's a, it's a blended way of doing it. Because remember, fees are important, particularly as a retiree. Mm. So blended by doing the ETF, some outsourcing, you need to have a blended fee that's quite reasonable. Uh, and it's got to be well under 1% if you're doing that sort of strategy when you blend it. So that's a good way to approach it. Mm. Always look for experts, always do the homework yourself and understand the risk you're employing there. But yeah, don't disagree too much with that. It's a pity we don't disagree on anything here, but we need to disagree on something, I'm sure. Yeah. But, uh, but, but broadly, that's what you've got to do. Remember, with small cap, more than anything else, how much are you willing to pay for future earnings? There's more risk embedded with small cap future earnings than large cap for obvious reasons. George, I don't care if my experts are Agree. It just means that there's more chance, I think, that they're going to be right. If you have two idiots arguing with one another, we don't know which idiot to agree with. But of course, neither of you guys are idiots, I've got to say, because you're actually largely agreeing with me as well, which I like. Now, George, uh, coming up for this year, there's this question mark over the US in terms of uh, a mini fiscal cliff and the Congress and all that sort of stuff. Could this be another, like the tape is, is one issue we're going to get this week, but do you think this is a mini fiscal cliff problem for the US that could rock stock markets? No, nothing entrenched that's, that, that's going to create a bear market. There's going to be concerns, there's going to be issues. Volatility is a normal event. Markets are just jumping at shadows over the past five years for obvious reasons. So obviously the FOMC this week, this is key. This is key for many reasons. The tapering will start. How do they communicate it? What's the timeline? Does it involve mortgage-backed securities or just the, just the US government bonds? How do, do they support the housing recovery that's ongoing? Does Janet Yellen take, on, take the chair on board? She's currently the uh, deputy governor and she's a fairy godmother. She's more dovish than everyone else. Is that a positive for markets? And then what do you do with Congress going forward? They've got those issues to work through. But an expanding US economy, an expanding economy that's the largest in the world, is very positive to turn around the tax receipts for, for Washington. So it's all working in their favour for, for GDP growth, therefore earnings growth steadily in the years ahead. So that may help sort of calm the nerves. But nevertheless, people will jump at shadows every chance they get. Mm. That just seems to be the norm over the past five years. But if I can always repeat, remain alert as an investor, but never be alarmed. Okay, Paul, one last thing. Are you surprised we haven't seen a 10% correction over the last six months? And, and do you think there's always a possibility? Or well, we, had a, we did have a good correction in, uh, in April, May, Peter. Yeah. Um, yeah. I don't think it was quite 10%. No, but it wasn't. We got there closely. Mm. Look, I still think there's a lot of people that are pretty bearish out there. Yeah. And you still bring up most of the financial press. And uh, yeah. you know, people are still worried about Europe and all the other things. And 
Look, as I said, we've been calling this market for a couple of years uh, as being a good opportunity. Mm. I think it looks all right. I mean, going back to the US, I'd rather see the the statistics supporting there's real growth occurring. Mm. I don't really care about the Fed. I actually care about there being growth in the US economy. Yeah. And that's what I'm much more concerned about. So mm. I think the Fed, the market's going to accept the Fed, whatever it does. Yes, yeah. And I'd really like to see you know, continuing you know, stronger employment data mm. and uh, retail sales and consumer spending in the US. It's like we're in the scepticism phase and we haven't reached the optimism phase of this bull market. And I guess the longer the scepticism phase lasts, the longer the bull market can run. Because usually you go get the optimism, then euphoria, and that's when the market usually yeah. falls over. But we might be getting close to optimism, but mm. we're certainly not euphoric. No. Um, if you we could have made the same comment about the Sydney property market six months ago. Mm. It was clearly an uptick. Now everyone's talking about uh, Sydney property. Melbourne's maybe starting to follow. Mm. Uh, but so uh, property's in the sort of the same sort of cycle. But I still think there are still more people still thinking there's uh, still more negative things on the horizon. So I think we've got a bit further to go. Yeah. And George, are you worried about a housing bubble and the Reserve Bank overreacting and raising interest rates and choking off this uh, recovery we're seeing? Uh, look, not at all. There might be a housing bubble and a couple of postcodes in the eastern suburbs of Sydney and Melbourne. But when you look at median house prices, when you look at Australia-wide, there's nowhere near a housing bubble. Uh, and, and, and remember, a 2.5% cash rate today is the equivalent of 4.5% 10 years ago because of the funding costs. So this is why they need to cut rates in November. This is why they need to stay lower, another historic low for longer. And this is why you need to continue to build the wealth effects coming out of superannuation and equity markets slowly starting in the housing market. You need to build on those wealth effects like North America is, and that's what drives earnings going forward. There won't be an inflation impact, and I think it's overdone the bubble. But we're dropping the word bubble and uh, like, like it's no tomorrow, but we need to put it in perspective. A housing bubble is a 40% appreciation in a short space of time, yeah. and that just won't happen from a median house price perspective. Yeah, so the media has been going along for the ride. Thanks, George. Thanks, Paul. Thanks, Peter. Cheers. Thank After you. the break, we'll put the spotlight on the transparency in our superannuation system.